welcome. I want to welcome everyone to our virtual town hall with Council Member Carlina Rivera. We are still awaiting her arrival. So if you've not taken the opportunity to pose a question, we would love to hear from our uh, audience today and know what is on your minds as we begin to have this conversation. Hi. Welcome. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Welcome, Hi. Council Member Carlina Rivera. How are you? I'm doing okay. Just was on the radio doing an interview on our hospitals and the kind of the state of COVID on WNYC. So I'm sorry I'm a little bit late, but I'm so happy to join you. How are you? I am doing well, and we have the public prep community here to um, share in and learn more about what we're what you're working on and what we can work on together uh, as we are all going through COVID in our very first town hall. So we're happy that you are the first um, and certainly won't be the last council member to join us and join our community. Um, just give me one second. I just need to, I'm working two screens here, so I want to bring it. Uh, a second document. Okay, let me try something else. Figured it out. I uh, just wanna say again, welcome to everyone. I hope you're joining us from somewhere there where you are safe and healthy. For those who don't know me, I'm Janelle Bradshaw, Superintendent of Public Prep Academies that encompasses Girls Prep Lower East Side of which council member um, Carlina Rivera represents as well as Girls Prep Bronx and Boys Prep. Uh, we are pleased to be joined today by Council Member Rivera, who's really going to share some updates on the COVID-19 crisis. As you just heard, she just got off the radio on NYC. Um, and so we're so appreciative that she can come and talk to our community about resources that may be helpful to all of you. Also, as we get started, want to note that we will be recording today's webinar. So those who could not join us will be able to view at a later date, or if you have to go early, we understand. Uh, we certainly know that COVID-19 has impacted all of us personally and professionally in some way, shape or form. And it's really changed how we've had to think about all aspects of our lives that we previously didn't put much thought into. Uh, and as a leader of a group of five pre-K through eight public charter schools with close to 2000 kids in the South Bronx and the Lower East Side, I've been faced with leading an organization that's deeply committed to first and foremost, ensuring the safety and wellness of our scholars and families, while also balancing providing a rigorous academic program online. Our communities and leaders have banded, banded together in ways that have truly inspired me. And I think we have some images coming up just to share some examples for uh, those who are joining us. Yes, there we go. Uh, our, as uh, you can see, these are just a few of the images that we uh, are really proud of in our community from teachers finding new ways to be creative and innovative about the ways in which they are teaching. We are completely uh, uh, excited that we were able to distribute more than 400 Chromebooks to students who need them and are also launching a second round of uh, Acer tablets that we'll be providing to our first and second grade families so that they have the developmentally appropriate tech uh, to support their needs. We've also worked with some amazing partners to make sure our families and local communities have their basic needs met. Um, partners like Red Rabbit, um, who has supported us in expanding their food delivery, not only to schools in our community, but also to local um, hospitals and first responders who are also um, doing this work on a day-to-day -day basis. We've provided meals to families who've had some food insecurity, as well as connecting them to partners in the space um, who are supporting them. 
but I definitely wanted to hear from you, council member, about all of the work that your office has been doing to lead um, in this uh, pandemic that we find ourselves in and ensure that your constituents have the support that they need to get through this crisis. Want to remind everyone before I pass the mic over, please take advantage of the Q&A function of this webinar to ask questions. We will have time to answer a few before we close today. Without further ado, Council Member Rivera. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Councilwoman Carlina Rivera. I proudly represent uh, Girls Prep and a number of other schools in the Lower East Side. Um, really all trying to work together uh, during this unprecedented crisis. And I know that we've been we've faced with, with tremendous challenges and, and tragedies. And every night at seven o'clock, we get together to celebrate our healthcare heroes. And I, I think that's important for us because, um, you know, we're working through a lot of trauma right now. And I'll, and I'll get to a little bit about that, but uh, I did want to make sure that I address some of the things I really wanted to talk about today, which are which is on the services and the programs that are being provided in my district and across the city during this pandemic. I would say that our number one issue that we're facing right now that I get tons of calls about. Um, I do get a lot of calls about unemployment insurance, of course, about making sure that people can stay in their homes and in their communities, um, and lots of questions about paying the rent, but also it's just about food access. We have many, many, many people who are food insecure. As you saw, the city opened uh, over 400 hubs where you could get, any New Yorker can walk in and get three meals a day, which I think is absolutely critical considering what we're facing right now and the future of our economy. Um, and so those 400 hubs serving three meals a day, um, taking into account uh, dietary restrictions and limitations have been important. But we've also been delivering uh, meals and food boxes to hundreds, if not, I think thousands of tenants at this point. So we're working with the food czar. Uh, that's what we call her, Commissioner Garcia, uh, who's a part of our kind of larger administration in the mayor's office uh, to make sure that no New Yorker goes hungry. We're very lucky to have Food Bank and City Harvest uh, also working with us. We have great organizations who have stepped up, Vision Urbana in my district, uh, led by Eric Diaz. And we've also had larger corporations come in and really step up. And so Beam Living, that's a management company in my district, under the larger hedge fund Blackstone, has provided tons of produce uh, that we've packaged and distributed. And all of this is through volunteer networks. So we've pretty much uh, launched a volunteer program. We did this similar right after Hurricane Sandy, uh, but of course this is very, very different, right? Because you can't have the same physical interaction, which is probably what I, I miss the most, right? Which is hugging a constituent that I haven't seen in a really long time, or, or you know, just, I guess, culturally, you know, we kiss people hello. Um, so I really do miss that. But the volunteers have been incredible just yesterday, I was in, in two buildings, one entirely of seniors uh, who really speak English as a second language, Spanish and Chinese being the languages. And the second was uh, an entire building of low-income families, Section 8. So the, the food program has really ramped up. And again, we're dropping boxes of food all over the district. And this is happening citywide in many of our low-income neighborhoods. If you know anyone who is food secure, it doesn't matter where you live please contact our office. Um, we, again, want to make sure that no, no New Yorker goes hungry. And I know, especially for our students, you can't really focus on your work if your tummy is growling, if you feel hungry. And I know all of these families, all of you on this call, you're here because you care, because you want to be involved, and you know that we have to be in this together. So that's one is the, the volunteers, the food program. And then of course, we're really trying to make sure that we, all of our students have the, the tech that they need, right? In order to do this remote learning. And thank you to all the, the, the faculty and the staff because this has been new for you as well. And we're all kind of going through the, the, the same sort of emotions while trying to figure out this whole new world. Uh, so while we're doing that, we're, we're trying to figure out in the city how we can save some of the programming that we've clearly lost. So maybe you missed that after school program or you missed that weekend 
a program or, or the sports that you played. I grew up playing sports. I grew up playing basketball and softball and volleyball. And I was in the math club and I did whatever my mother actually could find also for free. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the New York Public Library and I miss the library, right? So making sure that we are figuring out what our young people can do this summer. Maybe you're not old enough to work yet, but eventually we want to make sure that for those that can, that there are internships or opportunities available to keep you busy and help you just develop personally and professionally. So right now that is my focus are the youth programs this summer and how when we eventually ease restrictions, which won't happen for a while, um, that we're going to be able to uh, open up our schools and open up our, our, our buildings in New York City with the kind of robust and creative enrichment program programs that we desperately need. And so the last thing I'll say about that is that I do have a bill also to open streets. And that is, uh, you know, not just to, to ride your bike, but it's in order to get out to stretch your legs for people who have strollers, for people who are in wheelchairs, and that live in places with narrow sidewalks, or in many neighborhoods, a lot of people cannot walk to a park. Many, many, many New Yorkers cannot walk to a park. And we want to make sure that as we're practicing safe social distancing, where maybe it's an essential worker who is uh, waiting at a bus station, or if you've seen some of the lines at some of our supermarkets, we wanna make sure that there's enough room there so that we, we don't see kind of a second wave, a second outbreak, because we saw what the first one put us through. It was incredibly traumatic. Um, so we're working on a little bit of everything and uh, making sure that you all have what you need to continue learning and growing and always being a big, a big supporter and cheerleader. Thank you. I, I loved hearing the notion of making sure that no child and no family in New York City goes hungry. And I think making sure we have those resources to ensure that um, families who are experiencing food insecurity know that there is help and that we're partnering together is really, really helpful because we have definitely seen over the longevity of this uh, crisis that family needs are changing on a week to week basis and what may have been their normal is being adjusted with each week. So we, we absolutely appreciate that. Could you talk a little bit about, we're certainly hearing from our families, a sense that you know their sons and daughters who are six and seven and eight and nine are scared to go outside. And so even when we start thinking about opening schools, what kinds of supports and partnerships are available uh, for speaking to children about what we're all experiencing, the collective trauma um, and the emotional and response support that could be available in the city? Thank you so much for this question. Um, this has been on my mind um, so much because not only were students, teachers, educators, everyone, you were kind of forced into this remote learning situation while dealing with whatever's going on in your own family, while seeing the fatalities in, in our black and brown communities of which is a large population of your students and feeling you know, just, just those emotions of, of a, a history of a lack of investment in many of our communities and that's especially for mental health. So, you know, as, as we're going through this, we want to do a couple of things. One is, right, we don't just want to set up a, a hotline. A hotline is, is good, and it's important that people feel like they can call someone. And even now, I believe the Thrive Program for New York City has extended to even text messages. So if you don't want to call, you can text the person how you're feeling. When it comes to specifically young people and children, um, again, this is something I'm taking very seriously. So every Tuesday at 7.30, I have a Facebook Live program. I make it about an hour because I know people's um, attention has been kind of on the computer all day. And we're trying to bring experts. So I've had Dr. Katz, who's the CEO and president of Health and Hospitals, to talk to us about that situation. And we just had someone uh, this past Tuesday talk about the housing situation. He was a housing attorney, along with an organizer to really explain what the rent strike that's happening today, May 1, is and kind of how to get involved or what are the implications. Next Tuesday, we're having a, a child psychologist come on, someone to talk about how to understand, deal with those feelings and what you can do. Um, again, I always defer to the professionals on issues like this. And we're also going to be having a hearing in the city council 
on just the mental health piece, also programs for people with disabilities. I'll be having that oversight hearing. I don't have a date yet, but we'll let you know, along with council member Diana Ayala, who represents East Harlem and El Barrio, who's the chair of the mental health committee, uh, because th this is the piece that I think um, we really have to start setting up infrastructure like yesterday. Um, what, what teachers and what students are going through, you know, some people are even at in, inside of a home all day, which isn't really healthy to them as a person. So we're seeing even a rise in numbers in terms of domestic violence and other situations. So dealing with all that is going to really need a comprehensive program, uh, a focus on socio-emotional learning, which you all do really, really well. And to look to the experts, like what has worked for you? How are your guidance counselors feeling supported? What about your social workers? You know, this is so much more on top of everything else that they're dealing with. So we wanna do oversight hearings. We wanna make sure that there are programs and services set up for families who understand culturally uh, stigmas that are attached to this. I can tell you in the Latino community, stigma around mental health, you know, it's not something uh, I think historically that we've talked about, but that we're more open to and just acknowledging some of those things. And in terms of the programming, you know, we're also trying to let people know that I, uh, you're home, right? But there are some incredible programs out there um, that you all are, are helping to, to support, amplify, and even coordinate. And even places like the New York Public Library or, you know, like Yoga for the People or whatever it is that you get out, that you try to keep moving and, and keep talking and making sure that you're taking care of yourself because that's going to be number one as to how we all move through this take care of yourself and try to check in on your loved ones and council member thank you for those reminders we will make sure that our team is coordinating with your office so that as you're having these opportunities we can share them out with our community so that they can um, uh, participate and we can continue that partnership we have another question around summer and I know you spoke briefly, there's a deep concern in our communities around all of the potential losses uh, that are happening this summer with uh, due to budget cuts and restraints, uh, pools being closed, limited opportunities for summer youth employment, um, for risk of after school and summer camps is certainly on the minds of our families. And so do you have any general ideas around summer that families can start thinking about now? Uh, and also resources and supports uh, to uh, point them to as we adjust to our new normal. Sure, absolutely. So earlier this morning, I was on a, a call, uh, a meeting like this, uh, with Make the Road, which is a large organization doing uh, incredible organizing citywide, but really in Brooklyn and in Queens, and just our, generally our major concerns with the, the cuts to summer youth. So we, we've been, uh, and I'll get a little bit wonky on the budget just for like 20 seconds, is that we've been served incredible uh, cuts to the city budget. Uh, very, very alarming. Two billion this fiscal year, another maybe five or six or seven billion for the next fiscal year. And I think what was most troubling to me was seeing that those cuts were to education and youth programs before anything else. And I'm, I'm having a very hard time understanding why we would do something like this when we know that young people not only deserve uh, support, but they need it. They need to stay busy. And when they're hearing that the pools are going to be closed, that the beaches are going to be closed, um, who knows when the libraries will reopen. I spent a lot of summer in libraries, clearly. Um, you know, or, or that, that- So piece, did I, so did I. Right, right, okay. And that summer camp that you went to that whether you paid a small fee or whether you got a scholarship, which I did many, many times because my mom, uh, raised by a single mom, just couldn't afford it. You have to stay busy. You have to stay busy. So what, we're, what I'm focused on right now is trying to save as much of, of the Summer Youth Employment Program as I possibly can. And I have some great partners in the council. Um, you know not every council member has the same priorities. And so when we're looking at what the, who this program serves, which is uh, predominantly low-income families, low-income youth, youth of color who are at risk, I think it's so important that we save it. So maybe we won't save you know, every single slot, which is heartbreaking, but we're gonna try to save as much of it as we can. We have some 
some elected leaders who are fighting, but we also have leaders of, of great uh, nonprofits. I mentioned Make the Road, but uh, Jennifer Jones Austin of FPWA, uh, she has been incredible in trying to fight for the restoration. And I think that public private partnership piece that we've seen a little bit, right? We've seen Open Society give generously to an immigrant relief fund and Robin Hood give generously to, to another fund to, to support families and put money in their pockets. But we need more. We need to see more of this philanthropy. And I think how, what we can do to supplement what we will ultimately probably lose in summer youth are, where are the paid internships with, with some of these companies? Um, how can we make sure that people even just spend a few hours, even if it is working virtually? Um, but, but that kind of development, I think, is so important. So, so my goal is to, to save as much summer youth as possible and then to really fight some of the cuts that we're seeing to education because, you know, you fundraising, fundraising privately for educational institutions, you know, that requires a whole nother staff. And you just don't have the resources. It's not fair. What's more important than a person's education? I, I don't know. Their health and education is the most important thing. Um, so we're going to be focusing on that. And then, of course, um, trying to remember that arts and culture is also going to be instrumental, not just um, because it's a good thing for a child to have. But art therapy, I think, is going to be really, really critical moving forward. So I don't want to leave our arts and cultural institutions out. Um, they certainly deserve all our support and of course the nonprofits out there. So we're going to be focused on trying to save as many youth programs as possible and absolutely fighting the education cuts. That should not be where we go first when we're looking at agency cuts to see, you know, a very, very low percentage in, in an agency like the NYPD, you know, 0.5% cuts versus 49% in the Department of Youth and Community Development, which is that our youth agency of the city, it just something doesn't seem right there. And there's a ton of conversation ahead of us still, and there's a lot of negotiation. I'm on the budget negotiation team in the city council, um, but it's gonna be a long, hot summer. And I wanna make sure that, that your families and all the families in New York City feel supported. So along those lines, what are some concrete tactical things that our families can do to make sure that their voices are heard by their council members like you and everyone else who are fighting for them? Is it calling? Is it coming to your office? You know, we want to make sure that everyone feels that sense of agency um, to express their concerns so that you can speak and advocate on their behalf. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, listen, I know that um, people say, oh, what? So what am I going to email? I think you should absolutely email us, right? Maybe you can't come to our office this time to drop off like a stack of petitions. But when we receive um, emails from parents, council members bring them up. You know, myself and, and council member Chin uh, from District 1 downtown, we brought up that we have received a number of of uh, emails advocating one, to stop the budget cuts and two, over the grading policy that was discussed by the chancellor and the mayor. So I am gonna always look to people who contact me. It, it, it absolutely works reaching out. Sometimes I get text messages, sometimes I get emails or I get a, a DM, right? A direct message on social media. I take those stories, I take those experiences and I take even those two line emails and I bring them with me into the room and I say, you know, families are really, really upset. I've received a dozen emails today just on this topic alone. And what are you doing to address it? And then in the end, if, if it, you know, press always works, right? I, you know, I have to just say, I know it's like, you don't need one more thing to do, but really making sure that if something just feels wrong, if something is clearly unjust, getting it covered in the media, even if it's a letter, whatever it is, that works too. The mayor notices when things are in the media and um, they receive, it receives a certain amount of attention. So I know this requires organizing, which a lot of people might not have time for because they're worried about paying the rent and going grocery shopping and maybe taking care of someone in their family. But if you do make that call, uh, write that email, please know that we see it and we take it with us into the room to say, these are our constituents and, and they deserve a, a voice in this matter. Wonderful, and I know we'll be giving out your contact information at the end. We have a question from our 
uh, participants. There's a question around fresh food resources and Queens. I know that you represent the Lower East Side, um, but this family lives in Queens and whether or not you know of any options um, such that you described in the Lower East Side or even pointing them to uh, who they might contact or reach out to. Okay, okay, great. I see this now. Mel Mia, uh, Cordis. Okay, so in, in Queens. So I would say um, the easiest thing to do because I'll be very honest, in the beginning of, uh, towards the beginning of when the pandemic really forced us to, to stay home and self-quarantine, the food delivery system was really kind of a disaster. But since then, uh, you know, we have Commissioner Garcia, who's leading the way, and getting those, those food uh, meal, those meal deliveries to your home is a little bit easier. So I would start with calling 311 saying that you, uh, you know, saying get food, you could even text um, and letting them know exactly what you need, whether you have dietary restrictions or whatever it is. Um, and, and they should be able to help you. If for whatever reason you call 311, you're feeling frustrated, you're not getting the help that you need, you can contact my office. It's okay that you live in Rosedale or or Little Neck, I don't care where you live. I just want you to know that you have elected officials that are going to assist you. So I will um, do what I can to help you if you're not able to get the answer or the support that you need. But just know that 311, our work with 311, as well as um, uh, I guess the Department of Health and Commissioner Garcia, who's who's leading the, our food efforts, we've been on we we're on calls at least probably a couple times a week, just figuring out things on how to enter information a little bit better in the back end. So we're constantly trying to improve the system in little tactical ways. And some of that is by uh, recommendations from people who have utilized the system. Thank you. There is another question. It actually came up in our parent group yesterday, connected to some of those uh, education cuts the notion that some schools don't have full-time nurses in their buildings every day. And so it is raising a sense of anxiety for families uh, to know that we potentially will be sending children back into buildings where there isn't a nurse on site every day to do temperature checks or um, just uh, support their students. And there's also a concern about public transportation. So I'm not sure how many, I'm sure you guys are thinking about these things, but in terms of as we think about what reopening a school might look like, those are some of the concerns that families have expressed um, to us as a small group, and it's also coming up in some of the Q and A as well. So, right. So I see. I see some of these. Let me ask. I guess address the first one about the nurses in schools. So I, I think you know when we look at our school system, sometimes your schools are not just the only place that some students get a, a real hot meal with fruits and vegetables and protein and what they need to, to keep growing and be strong, but sometimes it's the only place that a student receives medical attention. So I just wanna acknowledge that and say that when we do open our schools, I uh, reopen our schools, which won't be until at least next year. And I, I think the chancellor said that was 50-50 uh, and I realize how frustrating that language is when you hear, like, you know, flip of a coin chance that doesn't really help you plan the next few months of your lives when many of you are working. Um, but, you know, the nurses in schools, we have to be careful. We can't ease restrictions uh, because finally we flatten the curve. I certainly don't want to risk a second outbreak. I don't want to risk losing more New Yorkers and healthcare personnel. I think at the end of this, we'll see how many doctors, nurses, and frontline workers we really did lose in this pandemic. Um, but uh, you know, when we reopen, I think it, I think we're going to have to focus on a few things. We're going to have to focus on making sure that there is a, a medical service provider there, uh, especially in places that are not close to a hospital, where you might have that relationship where a doctor comes in who can easily walk over. Um, and then making sure the guidance counselor and the social workers, because I think that's all a part of like your holistic health. Uh, in terms of the transportation, again, I realize how, you know, we're all watching a lot of news and some of it is informative and some of it is just uh, anxiety inducing. Uh, so when we hear that the school bus contracts all got canceled to save money, we're wondering what that means for the next fiscal year. 
So right now, as, as our fiscal year the city wise is coming to a close, we're supposed to settle on a budget in June for July 1st. We will be looking to make sure that wherever you need to go, um, that we'll make it happen. I mean, I represent a, a, a fairly large number of schools that they rely on the school buses to bring students from all over the city. It's a citywide K through 12. That's at least one of the schools in, in my district uh, called Nest. And um, uh, we're, we're gonna make sure that, that we support you all when it comes to transportation. I always say there's, there's four basics in life, but there's five basics in New York City, right? It, it's, it's food, healthcare, housing, and education. Those are, I think, basic human rights. And in New York City, it's transportation too. So I realize that that's a, that's a priority of mine. And we have an excellent um, committee chair on education, council member Mark Traeger, who represents South Brooklyn. He has been very, very vocal on all of these issues. So know that, that we're trying our best. Some things are a little bit up in the air. I wish I could give you all the answers, but uh, we're trying to work closely with the mayor and the chancellor. And uh, of course, utilizing you, your experiences to do the right thing. Well, again, we're happy to join in those uh, conversations. We do see that there are some specific public prep questions uh, for our network, so we will absolutely address them in our additional communication. We are uh, not ignoring them, but there are some other questions that we have that we want to get the councilwoman's perspective on. Let's turn actually to uh, unemployment. You spoke about that. Uh, this is a specific question just around what is the city doing to ensure small businesses, I would even say micro businesses, uh, many of which are uh, more cash based um, and not having access to banks? What are, what are, how are we helping to support those businesses with relief and efforts um, so that they can come back once the economy is restarting? So this is a great question about unemployment. I realize uh, people had tremendous difficulty in even accessing the system. Uh, at the very, very beginning, uh, people uh, were waiting days, if not weeks, to file claims. I realize that is still a challenge. Uh, we call for a number of changes that were made. There's the callback system. Uh, there was just the upgrade generally to bandwidth. I think you'll, what we have found, and, and maybe, maybe PrEP also found this to be true, but we had to increase bandwidth exponentially at the council to deal with all of the remote learning, right? To keep things secure. So um, the unemployment, you know, I think it's 30 million people nationally filed New York City. Uh, I think the early estimates were half a million jobs are going to be lost um, in terms of our uh, immigrant and undocumented workers. Uh, they weren't even included in the CARES Act in terms of that stimulus money that went out. So there have been a couple of uh, public private funds that I mentioned, you know, Open Society, uh, Robin Hood, trying to make sure they're taking care of families. Um, but for our small businesses, and especially in my district and citywide, right, these are also jobs. These are people's uh, lifelong dreams. They have put all their money into these businesses. And right now with the federal government and the Paycheck Protection uh, Program, which, what, which is billions of dollars in funds to help small businesses. Some businesses are starting to receive responses and they're starting to receive some of those monies that they applied for. Uh, but what we did is that we left a lot of the discretion to banks. And I always have a big problem putting all of this power into the hands of banks, especially these larger ones that haven't really proven to take care of some of our uh, historically disenfranchised communities but they were allowed to pretty much, they were given a ton of autonomy to determine who in their customer base they were gonna allow to apply. So I've seen numerous issues with like Chase specifically and, and some of our larger organizations like Grand Street Settlement, a very big nonprofit, couldn't apply for this kind of support or aid through Chase and they went to a smaller federal credit union um, and so I think these smaller community development financial institutions have really proven to step up and, and to support these small businesses. So beyond the PPP and fixing those issues and getting uh, uh, money into the pockets of our workers uh, with unemployment insurance, with stimulus check, which I know $1,200 in New York City is not a lot of money. 
Um, we're trying to work in the council to protect our small businesses. I have a piece of legislation uh, that would protect the personal liability of our small business owners. So that way, if they do have to walk away from their businesses, which is absolutely heartbreaking, that they're not facing personal financial ruin or bankruptcy. We just heard that bill two days ago. And I'm hoping that along with uh, my open streets bill, which is just to promote safe social distancing in, in places where they don't have a ton of space, um, passes. We have other bills that we're putting forward in the council to try to help small businesses and with an essential worker bill of rights. Um, and of course, helping students and families, making sure that there's Wi-Fi in our shelter systems, because we also know that students experience problems when not having Wi-Fi enabled device in, in some of our temporary housing uh, facilities. Um, so yeah, trying to look out for small businesses in that way. I've done a, a ton of town halls with local merchant associations and uh, business improvement districts. Everything's gonna look a little different going forward. But you know, eventually when we're able to ease restrictions, I'm hoping that you know, our small businesses can maybe spill out into the sidewalk that we widen or into the street, make a little money that way, and um, uh, make sure that hopefully we can create another type of fund because even with an eviction moratorium, in a couple months, people are gonna be faced with all of the arrears that they've accumulated over these, over these weeks. And it's gonna be a, a very serious you know, situation on top of the economic crisis we're already going through. Council member, you've mentioned the eviction pause a number of times. Let's just make sure everyone has that information. What is that? Who, how does that work? Who do you talk to? Let's make sure everyone understands, uh, as you said, housing is a fundamental right. It is um, super expensive in New York City, as we all know. Uh, and so making sure our families uh, know what resources they have would be really important. So right now there is an eviction moratorium. I think it's in place for about 90 days, which is it, since it was implemented in March, think about it, right? April, May, June. So by, by June, mid-June, um, the eviction moratorium will be lifted unless we can successfully advocate for an extension, which is what we're trying to do with legislation in the city council, which, which is to extend uh, um, pretty much, you know, when you're going through eviction, you're faced with the, the marshal's notice and, and a number of seizures related to the sheriff's office. So we want to delay all that even further until April 2021. We're trying to do that. But for right now, for 90 days, evictions are not allowed in New York City. If you have a landlord who is harassing you, threatening to throw you out in the next uh, a few weeks or even in the next month or so, they are not allowed to do that. They are harassing you, which is also illegal. And there are a number of, of nonprofit institutions and legal aid attorneys that are willing to help. So I just want to make sure that I give you um, a, a, one of the resources in, in the last, uh, what I mentioned, we had a housing attorney on Tuesday to kind of tell you what your rights are, which is you're not allowed to be harassed. You're still supposed to receive emergency repairs if you need it. And of course, frivolous litigation, uh, a, a landlord taking you to court for really no reason at all, if only to try to push you out. All of those things should not and, 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 and should not be happening to you and we wanna help. So one great organization that can answer your questions is Mobilization for Justice. They're a legal aid organization. Monday through Friday, nine to five, they're taking, uh, they take questions and their number is 212-417 3700 212-417-3700. And we're happy to share with you a number of our, our partners that we work with very closely when it comes to housing. Thank you. That is absolutely critical for our families to know. You also touched on Wi-Fi. Um, and we were really excited to hear that there was a private public commitment to expanding access to Wi-Fi for families so that our children weren't left behind. Um, and so again, those also have some 60 to 90 day term limits. Are there conversations about extending that, particularly in light of Governor Cuomo's announcement hot off the press that uh, schools in the state will remain closed for the remainder of the year? Um, 
how are, how are people thinking about that? So this is such a great question because um, we saw that a couple of the, the, the larger uh, internet companies, right? I'm going to mention Altice and Charter, right? Charter is Spectrum, Altice is, a, a, so they all kind of, they're very, very big companies. They have tons of money. So they said that they were going to uh, offer internet services to families. They had, then we had found out that families weren't being served if they had outstanding debt. We were able through advocacy to pressure and get them to change their policy. And so Altice and Charter were both uh, offering this program to families. Altice recently mentioned that they were extending this program until June 30th. Charter has not done the same. And so we're continuing to push for them to also uh, make the same extension till June 30th to make sure that you have that internet service. The biggest issue here is why is it so expensive, right? Why do 29, about 29% 29 of New York City households do not have access to online broadband internet service? How do I know that? Because we're working on, I'm co-chair of the census task, task force and I hope everyone has already completed their census because that's billions of dollars for our, our schools and our hospitals. Um, and we realized that as we were transitioning to this quarantine, you know, stay at home situation, you know, we had invested a lot of money into grassroots organization to do direct outreach and talk to people. So now that we're doing everything online, we realize a lot of people are not online. So we want to make sure that these companies are serving you. Again, they are multi-billion dollar companies who really should be making sure that that internet is affordable. I'd like to live in a city where internet is free, uh, but we're, we're a ways from that. So if you can, you know, tell your council member, tell whoever it is that you feel is appropriate that we should be pushing companies like Charter to extend that program to you until at the very least June 30th, though we know there will be a ton of learning online throughout the summer as well. Thank you for those uh, words. We are coming up on the close. I, I shared this a few moments ago for the public prep specific questions. We will address that on a separate town hall that we're scheduling, so stay tuned. Uh, also make sure that you're reading our newsletter that goes out weekly and the principal vi uh, videos as well as superintendent videos that happen on a weekly basis uh, so that you are up to date uh, and we will definitely respond uh, Council Member Rivera, is there any sort of last thoughts that you want us to take away from our time together? We really appreciate, uh, again, you being the first, but certainly not the last council member uh, to really come and, and share what's happening in the city and how we can all stay connected and, and partner together during these unprecedented times. Well, thank you for having me. What, what an honor uh, to be here. I wish I'd you know, dressed up a little more, but you know what happens when you're home and it's early. Um, I just want to thank you all for clearly, you know, you, you care about what is going on in our city. You care about your children receiving the best education that's possible. I would say if you have questions, you know, if you go to a New York City Council website, you can find my, my page if you'd like, even if you live in Queens or Staten Island or wherever. Uh, we do have a COVID-19 related area of our website with resources on, uh, you know, data and some of the numbers, but also I think really, really relevant uh, information related to resources. And then even some of those like at home things that you can do, we include in our e-newsletter. So on that same uh, New York City Council page, you can sign up for my e-newsletter. Again, we include all of these statistics, current campaigns what's going on in the council and also fun things that you can do at home that we, uh, you know, we, we kind of scour all kinds of, of not just the organizations in our district, but citywide, like some of the virtual tours and, and the fitness that you can do together at home uh, to make sure that we're all getting through this and, and keeping a smile on our face. So feel free to stay in touch with me. You can see some of the information there. I'm always, always at your service, no matter where you're from. And I appreciate you doing this for the families of, of, of public of, of prep and, and thank you. Thank you so much. And please take care everyone and stay safe. Thank you. And on behalf of the public prep community, we just want to, again, thank you. We can't say enough. We know that you have been uh, to visit our schools and really see what we're doing and 
our commitment to making sure there's a holistic education and a single sex environment, uh, first and foremost, is uh, always at the top of our minds. Um, and during this time, again, as I said at the top, our focus has been on ensuring that our families are safe and healthy and well. And a lot of the information that you have provided today um, are really the questions that our families are asking our staff. And so it's just really nice to have additional resources and opportunities to share those resources with our families because we can't do this in a vacuum. We need partnership um, in order to proceed. We're really looking forward to continuing uh, our partnership in the coming months. And for families on the line, I want to remind you that the Public Prep website has a ton of helpful resources that you can access at any time. I learned something new today, Mobilization for Justice, Open Society, Robin Hood. Um, using 311, you can send text messages to Thrive. Um, there are just so much available to uh, everyone in the city. I'm also looking forward to next Tuesday at 7.30. There'll be a special uh, Zoom meeting hosted by the council member that's specifically focused on how to uh, talk to your children about this epidemic. So again, uh, we are trying to and working together with others who are uh, providing that information uh, to families so that we can all get through this together. Please be sure to follow both Public Prep and Council Member Rivera on Facebook. It's just another great way to get information in general and specifically related to COVID. Again, thank you everyone for spending some time with us this morning. Please stay safe and we look forward to more conversations like this in the future. Councilwoman, you are welcome anytime to our schools and uh, hopefully we can do more of these types of conversations um, in the coming weeks and months ahead. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Take care.